it always is a delight to be here because there are so many good questions. This is why I do my research, is for people who have vision concerns, uh, vision problems, or maybe just want to pass along some advice to their children and grandchildren about what they can do to have the best vision during their lifetime. So thank you for coming. You've been hearing about a lot of things that we can't control in terms of getting macular degeneration, our genes, or the outside environment. There's some research that air pollution might contribute to AMD. But I'm delighted to say that there are many more things that we can do to control our um, chances of, there we go. Let's see, a oh, point in the right place, okay. <clears throat> Uh, things we can do for ourselves. And you've heard Dr. Mitchell, who talked a lot about these earlier in the session. I am going to just emphasize uh, more some of these other aspects about eating well, um, being active, and considering supplements if they're needed. And my, I want to point al also out that um, while we focus on AMD today, Many of these steps to improve vision and lower our chances of getting AMD are also the same things that we can do to be healthy overall, to, present, to prevent other types of chronic conditions that are more common as we age. And notably, <coughs> excuse me, um, cognitive issues. There are many similarities between, <coughs> excuse me, there are many similarities between the nutrient needs of the eye and the brain. And there are many parallels in the research on nutrition and cognition with the uh, findings on nutrition and eye disease. First, I want to acknowledge the many uh, collaborators uh, and team members that contribute to the research from our group that I'll show you today. Uh, this includes uh, Barb Blody, uh, the organizer of this uh, presentation, and she's a co-investigator on some of our main studies. There are several other faculty from our department that have made big contributions. We have um, a research team, and many of these members uh, will uh, be around at the, the department booth in case you have further questions about nutrition that haven't been answered. Um, and we have many collaborators across eight different universities um, in this country. Um, but also, you all are contributing to our research because you're taxpayers. And we get most of our money from the National Eye Institute. Through, uh, and also, some of you have contributed to our department and to the McPherson Eye Research Institute and much of our seed money for new ideas comes to us through that. Also, some of you contribute nationally to things like the research of event blindness. Those are really important, but especially important are those who have given of their time. Many people in the audience have participated in the ARID studies and in some of our diet and vision studies in the Women's Health Initiative, and I thank you for that. Uh, that is especially useful to us for all the time that you've given us. So let's see some of the results that we have learned together. Overall, I think there's mounting evidence that nutrition matters. It matters a lot. This doesn't come from one or two studies. It comes from clinical trials and population studies and many studies that lead up to it. The clinical trials that are done um, prove, they give us proof that the specific nutritional interventions lower risk for uh, disease. There are clinical trials of uh, nutrients in relation to many chronic diseases. There are clinical trials of whole diets. The clinical trials of whole diets show us that nutritional interventions lower risk for hypertension, a risk factor for eye disease, and many other processes that contribute to eye disease. Then specifically for uh, age-related eye disease, the ARID studies have shown us some specific nutrients that have an impact. 
And also new studies are now coming out that show one of the ingredients in the new ARIDS trial also helps vision. Uh, that's lutein and zeaxanthin. Now we're going to end up talking about lutein and zeaxanthin, but after the question session, I want to mention that one of the b bodies of evidence that is emerging is that higher levels of lutein and zeaxanthin in the diet and in our eyes uh, might help with some of the glare and the difficulty seeing at night. And that's more of a, a gentle uh, sunglass, if you will. So if you have AMD, the American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends this supplement that's tested in the ARIS-2 trial that you've been hearing about, and they've newly added lutein and zeaxanthin, together with a lot of other high-dose antioxidants. And you can talk with your doctor about whether these or alternatives are better for you. Now, these have been shown to slow the progression of eye, eye disease, but not prevent AMD or cataract extraction. And so we need to turn to a different type of study to get information about that. And we've gotten information about that from large population studies, of which there have been 20, 30, I think, internationally over the last 20 years especially. They suggest that healthy diets lower our chances of getting AMD and work synergistically with physical activity and not smoking. Importantly, different than trials, they can often tell us the size of impact over decades. And they can evaluate more aspects of diet. One of our population studies, um, the results of one of our population studies is shown as a slide. And you can see um, it gives the percent who have um, an intermediate stage of macular degeneration um, by th their, the healthiness of their diets. Those that have highest scores uh, adhering to the U.S. dietary guideline, you can see have, uh, uh, are more likely to have whoops, okay. um, those who have um, the healthiest diets on the U.S. dietary guideline um, have, I'm not targeting this correctly, here we go. Um, I'll speak it. Um, those who, um, you can see the, um, that the lowest blue line um, is for people who have the 20% best diet, highest scores on the healthy eating index. And you can see that they have a twofold lowering odds of having early stages of macular degeneration six years later. People who ate even more nutrient-dense diets, indicated in the yellow, um, ate um, diets which adhered to a Mediterranean pattern, which we're going to talk about much more, had the lowest risk, three-fold lower. Moreover, our research is suggesting that a combination of healthy lifestyles loaded the estimated, uh, lowest, lower the estimated risk for macular degeneration threefold. Here we're looking at the percent with intermediate macular degeneration and uh, what they reported in the terms of their lifestyle six years earlier. You can see that um, the people with the uh, lowest odds of having macular degeneration uh, exercised moderately, eight to 10 hours a week. Now some people, phew, that's a lot, but it, it counts housework and, and walking and uh, yard work, you know, it all adds up. It's just being active, getting out and moving. These women also had diets in the highest 20%, and they never smoked. And these are rates that are compared with people who exercised regularly, who did not exercise regularly, who had diets in the lowest 20%, and smoked for uh, more than a pack a day for eight years. A combination of healthy uh, lifestyles also lowered genetic risk. You can see by this bar that women who had, had healthy diets and uh, lifestyles had a twofold lower odds of having intermediate macular degeneration um, than uh, 
let me start again. Uh, these are uh, people who had the two complement factor H genes. So these are people at genetic risk. And if they had healthy lifestyles, they had a twofold lower odds of having AMD when we saw them six years later. So you might be able to eat away your genetic risk as uh, NEI investigator Emily Chu suggests, or in this case it looks like eat and exercise away your genetic risk, and that's good news. How did we come up with these healthy diet patterns anyway? It, this isn't something that happened just you know, a couple years ago, or even a couple decades ago. This research is foundational and started 50, well, actually 70 years ago. This started when Ansel Keys was noti noting that men had a really um, high level of coronary heart disease in the United States. I was wondering what, what is going on in the 1950s. There was a big study. He, he went to several countries and looked at men from several villages. And those villages are, um, they're not indicated uh, specifically here, but each of these dots represents one of those villages. He asked them about their diets and their lifestyles, mostly about their diets. And you can see that the men um, who had the highest intake of saturated fat had the highest risk for coronary heart disease death. You can see U.S. is right up there. And there was a high correlation. So people wanted to know, what do the people down here eat? And specifically, wouldn't you like to know what the people at this lowest uh, dot, lowest uh, coronary heart disease uh, death rate ate? Well, researchers did too. And those were men who lived on the Greek island of Crete. And that is where we got the Mediterranean diet. People then characterized the diet of people living on this island. We'll talk a lot about that. So in addition to the Mediterranean diet, there are many other healthy um, diets. Another is the DASH diet, or Dietary Approaches to Stopping Hypertension. If you've been to your doctor and you've been told you have high blood pressure, perhaps your doctor has told you that this is the first line of, of uh, lowering your blood pressure. So clinically tri uh, this clinical trial proved that high fruit and vegetable diets are associated with lowering of blood pressure, whether or not you have high levels of salt in your diet. Also, another healthy diet pattern are the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. They were developed right after World War II when we were looking at what we needed to keep our troops healthy and then extended to uh, include new research as it e evolved that describes what we need as a population uh, to have most of us um, in healthy conditions. This, they have changed. You may, there are a lot of, you, you, it, it sometimes seems like there's just new information coming out all the time. And so every five or 10 years, they revise U.S. dietary guidelines. And the way they've most recently revised it are in the same directions of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. So what do these diets have in common? Well, You've been hearing this morning, abundant fruits and vegetables. And I will say it again, because I cannot emphasize it enough. And um, we're talking five to nine fruits and vegetables a day. And it's better to eat them whole than as a juice. Why would that be? You can get many of the nutrients as a juice, but new research is showing that our microbiome likes that fiber we throw away. So consider, instead of drinking orange juice, eating an orange. Now, five to nine a day seems like a pretty high bar for many people. Uh, but if you break it down per meal, if we try for one to three per meal, it seems a little more achievable. If we have uh, three in each meal, two of them should come from vegetables or a, one large serving of vegetable, a one cup serving of vegetable. Um, and a fruit, 
If you're too full to eat a fruit at the meal, just save it for a snack. And there are many details I should mention in the handouts I've provided. So if you miss some of these details, um, there will be much more detail there. All of these diets also contain whole grains instead of whole refined grains. And they have daily variety of the protein sources, not just beef. They include plant sources, nuts, legumes, beans. They include greater than two servings a week of white meat, of fish, of eggs, and dairy and less than two servings a week of red meat or processed meat. And this is just a quick idea of what a day's healthy diet that would score high on these different patterns would look like. And you can see that it's varied. It's real food. There's no snack bars in there. Is plant food rich? And these, so it makes it very colorful and these are foods that we can get the most sensory pleasure out of eating. And sensory pleasure is important, especially as we lose some of our senses, as we get older. So these are nutrient rich, and they make the meal enjoyable. Now some of us um, know people who need help in preparing foods like this. And so it is often said that a good gift for someone who appreciates uh, these colorful, nutritious foods would appreciate um, uh, receiving um, soups and salads or stews that we make and give to them. Or, or if you have problems yourself, you might put on your wish list um, some, some Tupperware containers of beef stew that I could put in my refrigerator so that you could eat like this uh, more often. There are more aspects of the Cretan diet that I was curious about. So I, I actually went to Crease to learn what, what uh, parts of healthy lifestyle might be related to risk lowering. I found that most of the island remains rural and retains many of its traditional lifestyles, even when I went in 2010. This included physical activity in the sun. Now, wait a minute. The sun, wait, that's supposed to be dangerous. We did hear about that from Dr. Mitchell, and that's, he's right. Uh, but in, on Crete, they were sensible. They didn't go out between noon and five. They were out in the morning, and they were out after five. And there, where there's a lot of abundant sun, um, it was less toxic. It was, you know, so that we can do the same thing by going in more shaded areas or going, uh, going in late morning. We get more, but light provides something we need, and that's vitamin D. So if we're in the light and we have some of our skin exposed, um, we will make vitamin D, which research is showing is important to lower risk for AMD. So if you go out when you make the most vitamin D between 12 and 3, you want to remember your sunglasses. I want to spend a few minutes talking about some difference in Mediterranean diets uh, with relevance for macro degeneration, why you might want to think about Mediterranean diets specifically, and why so many, increasingly, with so many studies are showing people who adhere to Mediterranean diets have lower risk for having or progressing AMD. And these include higher intake of fish and greens. These especially include fish that are high in long-chain fatty acids, like DHA, that you might have heard about, fish oils. And these long-chain fatty acids especially concentrate in our eye and in our brain as well. We can get these fatty acids from other foods. We can get them from walnuts, olive oil, flax oil, and from greens. But if we get these um, fatty acids, these shorter-chain fatty acids, from these other diet sources, then we need to eat an abundance of these foods. And the reason is, we don't convert all of our shorter chain omega-3 fatty acids to longer chain, which are the type our eyes and brains specifically need. And I'm going to say a little more about greens in a minute, but first I want to talk about fish. <clears throat> Fish doesn't just provide long-chain fatty acids. 
clinical trials have shown that despite the fact that all studies that have been done show people who eat higher fish in their, uh, in their diets have lower macular degeneration, but it's maybe not all about omega-3s. The ARIDS trial didn't find that adding omega-3s uh, improved or slowed the progression of AMD over five years. Maybe it takes longer, uh, one, but one short-term study, three-year study, so showed that there was slowed progression over three years. But another possible explanation is that fish is providing other things that we need to slow macular degeneration process. This includes vitamin D, B vitamins, and minerals. And in particular, I want to highlight vitamin D, which I've mentioned. Oops. And vitamin B12. And the reason I want to point those out is these are the nutrients for which we commonly have low blood levels. Many of us do. Some doctors routinely measure these and some don't. But if you don't eat fish or, or, or don't spend time outside, you want to maybe ask your physician to get blood levels of vitamin D and B12 to see if you need these. So finally, I wanted to say another uh, thing about greens. When I was on Crete, I, it was a big eye-opener. I found that when they ate greens, they didn't mean just like a little iceberg salad. No, even in this country cafe, they didn't serve hamburgers, but they served me this huge wild green bowl, uh, which was delicious, by the way. Um, but every meal that you eat on that uh, island is rich in greens, lots of herbs. They also drink teas um, that are made from sage and dittany and, and other things. So they, they get a lot more greens in their diet than I even imagined. Now, what do greens provide? I showed you uh, that they provide omega-3s. They provide lots of vitamins and minerals. We are especially interested in, in the lutein that they provide. Remember, uh, lutein has been added to the ARIDS trial. And this is because uh, lutein is important to the eye. We accumulate it like the trees accumulate it and many sun-exposed plants, then you can even see the lutein when the chlorophyll recedes or the lutein in the pot if you boil uh, spinach and kale. And here you can see the lutein in the back of our eyes. You see that yellow pigment. We selectively accumulate it. And there's another image here at the bottom that shows the same pigment under blue light. Blue light that is damaging to our retina if we get too much, but, if you, but in small amounts, um, it isn't. And part of the reason is that we have a big patch of lutein there to absorb part of the damaging blue light if we eat lutein, okay? Lutein are some of the most abundant carotenoids in our diet from the 50 carotenoids that are in the food we eat. You're all familiar with beta carotene. Beta carotene and other similar carotenoids can make vitamin A. That is, of course, important eye health. You've heard carrots are good for eye health, and yes, um, that helps with night vision. Um, lutein and zeaxanthin differently um, come from leafy greens, as I've been telling you. And also, it's in some other products. Uh, the color of egg yolk is mostly, is mostly the result of the lutein and zeaxanthin that accumulates, as well as the color of corn. Now, lutein and zeaxanthin aren't the major carotenoids in the diet. We, in fact, we focused on beta carotene because that was the major carotenoid if you look at the blood level. But while lutein and zeaxanthin are only only represent 25 to 40 percent of the lutein in diet and blood. They represent 80 percent of the carotenoids that get into the eye. And all of the carotenoids that get into the neural areas, all the retinal layers that get damaged when we have AMD. And the concentrations in the eye are highly correlated to the concentrations in the brain, especially the area that process information about vision.
I'd also like to mention you see sometimes mesozeaxanthin on a pill uh, form. And this is another compound that is like lutein and zeaxanthin, um, but it accumulates uh, specifically in the very central area of the retina. We make it from lutein, so you don't necessarily need to take mesozeaxanthin separately. We measure lutein and zeaxanthin gets into the, our eye um, in our research, and it's a very simple and non-invasive measure. And you can see somebody having their macular pigment measured here at this uh, machine. And um, green and blue lights, low levels of green and blue lights are flickering. And it's a simple test to see, um, indicate when the flicker stops. And that's going to be proportional to the amount of lutein you have. And we, we make measurements at different, different areas. So very simple. And this has given us a lot of information. We've uh, used this information in this carotenoids and age-related eye disease study that we um, are conducting still. And this is an ancillary study of the Women's Health Initiative at three of the 40 Women's Health Initiative sites. So women who participated in the 1990s in the Women's Health, Health Initiative at Iowa, Wisconsin, and Oregon and provided much information about their lifestyles, their diets, and other aspects of health, were invited six years later to participate in our carotenoids and age-related eye disease study, or CARIDS. And they provided information about the density of those pigments in the back of their eye, and also information about their eye health, as well as more information about diet and supplements. And then 15 years later, many of these women came back again. They, we were able to measure their mac macular pigment density again, and also many more aspects of uh, vision structure and, uh, and vision function. And we're just now enrolling the last people this month. So from the first study, we learned a lot, 20 publications worth. But let me just show you one thing that I think is especially relevant to today's conversation. We found that macular pigment was higher in women who had gene variants for proteins that help take in lutein into our body, carry it through our blood and into the retina and stabilize it there in the retina. So this might explain why some of the small trials that give lutein and zeaxanthin do not see increases over short time in some people. Five to 50% who take supplements don't increase their macular pigment right away. But there are some things we can do for ourselves that can help increase it and possibly mitigate these genetic effects. People who consumed healthy fats had uh, higher macular pigment. And to a point, only people who had um, beyond the 20% lowest level. So a little bit is needed, and that's needed to help lutein absorb um, into the intestine because it's lipid soluble and also people who had high fiber diets. Now, even after we adjusted for the fact that many uh, lutein-containing foods um, are high fiber, we still saw this association. And we're working to try to understand why this is. Is there any link between our gut microbiome? Hmm. We know that it's related to inflammation. You know, so there, we think that there's some, something we have to learn here to understand this a little bit better. Or it might just be the other components in fruits and vegetables that help protect lutein from degrading. We don't know. I'm going to give you a sneak preview, finally, of um, early findings from our new study that we're, that's currently underway that we reported at our spring meetings. It is possible to increase macular pigment. So women who were the ripe young age of 55 to 80 uh, at the first exam, 15 years later, um, were able to increase macular pigment levels, especially if they had low levels 15 years earlier. And women who um, increased the most also took ARIDS-type supplements, most of them. 
and also they ate eggs, a lot of them. On average, 10 eggs a day. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I would hate for you to go home with that message, and so would your cardiologist. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's two eggs five times a week. So um, now it might be because the lutein in there is more bioavailable. Um, we don't know. Um, some studies suggest that. Uh, but if, you're, if you do have problems managing your cholesterol, uh, you want to talk to your cardiologist before you start something like that. So this is my last slide, and it tells you about a, a very important research direction that we're pursuing. We've worked mainly in older people um, and looked at eye diseases that are common in older people. But we learned some interesting things in those studies. The, even the older women who were breastfed had more macular pigment than those that were fed formulas. And we were able, with seed money we got from the McPherson Eye uh, Institute and our department, we were able to do a small study in middle-aged people. And we see the same thing again. So we need to conduct a little larger studies to continue to see if this is um, a bleep or is this real and, and how important is it? Because we still don't know so many things. And this comes at the same time that new research in, by others is showing that we accumulate lutein in the year after we're born, when our eyes and our brains are rapidly developing. And monkeys who aren't fed lutein do not accumulate these and have damage. We need to know. So we apparently need lutein in early life. But uh, formulas, which three quarters of us in the 70s were, were fed, don't contain any lutein. Breast milk does. In fact, it, breast milk concentrates lutein. So this is something important to pass on to family members, um, even before we know for sure um, the results of our outcome. So um, if you are interested in participating in a study where macular pigment is measured, there is a study that we're using to further our knowledge in this area that you can participate in. There's a flyer out at the Department of Ophthalmology page that you can um, pick up, or you can also sign your name if you're interested. So I thank you for your attention, and I'll look forward to questions during the questions session.